good afternoon ladies and gentlemen esteemed guests and the cherished members of our community welcome to a momentous occasion as we gather today to celebrate our foundation day marking the 15 years of dedication progress and unwavering commitment to our goal this day is a testament to the collective efforts and aspiration that continue to drive us forward towards a brighter future Today it is both an honor and a privilege to introduce a remarkable individual whose contributions to the legal profession and commitment to digital justice have left an indelible mark on our society. I stand before you to introduce Apar Gupta, a luminary whose journey is nothing short of inspirational. He is the co-founder of the Internet Freedom Foundation (IFF), an organization that has been at the forefront of advocating for digital rights. and online freedom in india and for raising awareness about issues such as net neutrality online privacy and freedom of expression he's also been a vocal advocate for transparency and accountability in government surveillance programs and has co-founded campaigns like save the internet and save our privacy for his work at iff he's been awarded the next now fellowship and the ashoka fellowship in 2019 He appeared in the Forbes 30 Under 30 list as the emerging voice in media laws. His work has earned him recognition on the global stage, where he has actively participated in discussions and collaborations with international organizations focused on similar issues. He is consistently championed in the cause of protecting citizens' privacy rights in an era where digital technologies often blur the lines between public and private spaces. We are privileged to have him with us today. so we welcome you Am I audible? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, thank you so much for inviting me here today, and I hope more friends can join. I know some of you may be messaging, so please do send them a message if you find this interesting, and objectively if you find this interesting. Okay. So, a big thank you to the director, the faculty, and all the students at Triple IT Delhi. Today, you mark 15 years of establishment. So, congratulations on this wonderful achievement. i say congratulations because many of us think that institutions run by themselves they don't they require persistent energy passion and also a definition of vision and vision does change to articulate the objectives for which any university any kind of institution is founded so congratulations again for breathing life breathing vision and excellence within these walls now while lawyers may start their speeches with caveats caveats are essentially conditions under which truths do not apply i will start by a confession i'm terrible at math and this is particularly for those two professors who took me for a coffee right now and teach math here but even then i am able to subtract these 15 years and go back to the year 2008 this was the year when i was in my first year of law practice i graduated actually in 2007 and if i subtract one year for my masters i also complete 15 years this very year 
And what has been this, my journey, my professional work over these 15 years has given me something to reflect upon, something to learn, and it's given me some success but many setbacks. Don't go by that introduction which was read out because Forbes 30, 30 under 30 has what as many publications describe a problem in which most of the people who are on that list go to jail for financial misappropriation, okay? And I'm in no way a luminary because um, as you can see that this lecture is quite dull, okay? <laughs> so I speak to you with the spirit of reflection of my own 15 years, right? And especially for institutions, which strive towards a culture of innovation and excellence. And these are two words which I take from your brochure of Triple IT Delhi itself. And I went through your website, and I went through the brochure, I went through all the materials into a very, very deep extent to find out that what did these mean. And of course, it's defined by the centers, the faculty. But I think that's primarily also defined by when an institution is established. So I go further back, and I go through the Triple IT Delhi Act of 2007, which in section five states the objects of the institution. Why is the institution established? What should it achieve? And these are seven objectives which are stated in section five in clauses A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And it says to establish and incorporate a non-affiliating teaching institute for imparting IT education in Delhi, but it also then goes forward towards external setting goals, not only inward looking ones, like having good faculty, great students. So it says, for instance, in subclause D, to create a paradigm shift in the way IT can be used for improving the delivery of services in selected domains. This is obviously outward facing. IT as a component of services and services, if nothing, to be used by society. To be a change agent that shall contribute to enable industry to develop state-of-the-art products and services. Of course, state-of-the-art, but then again, change agent, which presupposes that the status quo is not satisfactory. F, to be industry relevant at all times and to create an impact on the fellow academic community in India and abroad, which means that, of course, the contribution through much more tangible innovations is felt in terms of uh, industry-wide exposure, but its touch with the academic community is not lost, lost. And finally, to be an open institution to attract the best minds of the world and to be completely globally integrated. In some ways, also what the internet is. Now these objectives, as I said, are external facing. And I speak to you as people who have achieved it to a great extent. In fact, if we talk to students quite often in technical institutes in India today, which are the most valuable resource and in any technical institute, and apologies to the faculty, it's the students. Uh, many of them go out to have ambitions of being founders of large companies. They provide a lot of employment. They also push new forms of social interaction through new services, and they're very ambitious. So I toast to the ambition with a warm cup of coffee and to their future success. Genuinely, I do recognize this ambition and I think by itself, there is no sort of moral judgment which would be cast in effect towards saying that it's negative in itself. But at the same point in time, I say that these champions who herald excellence, who herald this kind of innovation, also today can benefit from a wider social perspective of how information technologies, how their own ambition may impact society. So where do I start? I think let me start at the year 1999. And that sounds like a good year because we thought that the computers would crash when the new year would come in. And I remember myself, nothing happened. It was pretty much uh, going out to a friend's party and forgetting and then booting your computer the next day and nothing much happened. Around that same time, a Harvard professor by the name of Lawrence Lessig published a popular epithet that would be sprouted in policy conferences and panels ad nauseum. I hear it every time I go, and to my regret, I have to use it as well, just like any other middle-aged man would. And it does not reduce the power of this idea, which still holds validity. His coinage, 
was of code is law and it was prophetic but also accurate in describing the power of information technologies to contour societies to shape them he basically first came to this idea by saying that there are four forces in society which can impact and shape them and software is going to be one of them if i quote from his book the code will present the greatest threat to both liberal and libertarian ideas as well as their greatest promise we can build or architect or code cyberspace to protect values that we believe are fundamental or we can build or architect or code cyberspace to allow those values to disappear there is no middle ground there is no choice that does not include some kind of building code is never found it is only ever made only ever made by us which means that the choices which are made in any kind of design of technical system will have a political value within it and we can see it in deployments of large services which are provided through biometric identification such as aadhar it can be seen in our interactions for gig workers for instance who use uh, any kind of software which by itself is determining their conditions of service and the payouts that they get there are choices which are being made which is also why the much more recent buzz around generative ai relies on explainability how do you build this model what does it do what are the choices which are being made etc etc but by itself beyond explainability what i also find to be fairly curious is that how this kind of insight which we gather over a period of time has led to exceptionalism which is that do not touch technology governance systems are rotten they are inefficient and by itself as much as choices are being made in technology in technical systems the law is not a force for good the law is a inefficient bureaucratic control by itself that needs to be resisted or not it needs to be ignored at the very least now let me take two instances from my own experience i remember when i first got the computer and it was capable of doing things more than you know basic uh, file swapping other kinds of things i immediately starting r- ripping cds so i first used to use this software called audio grabber extract the uh, each track and then i used to use another software to compress it into a mp3 and of course this is inefficient because you still needed a cd access to cds were not easy to come by right so we got into file trading and i did happen to use napster but before that i used iirc i used kaza then and there seemed to be a void when it was shut down for some time but along came bittorrent and indexers such as supernova and pirate bay right here technology that enabled the sharing of content in the india of then which did not have this level of broadband which did not have this level of repository of culture of knowledge seemed to be open access seemed to be something very foundational to the development of my own personality now what do you have in terms of its opposition to the law even back then what you had was copyright and intellectual property doctrines and today you have something called dynamic injunctions where somebody goes to court right before a movie is to be released and says that these are 20 pirate websites they may rename themselves the court should block them for access in india the same piracy websites in some way or the other even today serve as archival materials for film prints which are not available in india songs which are not available by itself books itself which are not even present in the best libraries of the world now one of the reasons why a lot of people may not honestly acknowledge it is that it is indeed illegal however the social value around this was chalta hai everyone does it it's just that you should not get caught and here the thinking which evolved was that the law is not a friend of access to knowledge much more recently i think so our modern uh, our modern uh, dilemma around content has changed completely today we are not dealing with a paucity of content we are dealing with a paucity of knowledge meaningfully deriving any kind of sense reality by itself and it's a pastiche of memes copies on copies reels and shorts and the conversation today has changed from open access 
to virality and its impact on mental health, social attitudes, and cognitive decline. But even here, we don't see the law as an ally. For the law, what at best it can do is block. It can give dynamic injunctions. Let me use another example. This is the second one. Over the same period, and this was when social networking had fi first started. I remember this started through chat applications, which are like ICQ, and we used to type in ASL, which was uh, short for age, sex, location, and then it went to the scrapbook style Orkut, and soon thereafter there was Facebook, which I resisted for the longest time. I didn't like it even when it started. And then came Twitter, which I do, did take a liking to. Later Instagram, and now finally YouTube, and now all of them together. So I made real and lasting friendships through these platforms. And I'm, I'm not afraid to say that. In fact, I've also made friends through pen pals before this. But what's happened much more recently is that we do not see these platforms as spaces of curiosity, learning by itself, but more towards advocacy, division, misinformation, and threat. Why has this happened again? And also, if you remember, when these platforms were first taking off, the legal risks and the law which we saw at that point in time was not in terms of the business models of these platforms which rely on gathering behavioral data and then serving contextual ads. We were fine with that to a large extent. At that point in time, the primary concern beyond the intellectual property doctrine happened to be intermediary liability, which was that the platform should not be held liable for the statements by an end user like me or you, because that itself would increase the liability, decrease innovation, and completely take away the interconnectivity aspects of what was essentially a dumb pipe, which was essentially an intermediary. In effect, the telephone company should not be, a very poor analogy, a telephone company should not be made liable for a person who phones in a bomb threat just because they cannot censor and monitor it. Right? So these kind of tensions, even when states did want to intervene, in fact, intermediary liability was one of the first battles uh, where the United States Supreme Court ruled on the Communications Decency Act in the case of ACLU versus Renault. And there, uh, Justice O'Connor stated that the interest in encouraging freedom of expression in a democratic society outweighs any theoretical but unproven benefit of censorship. They struck down large parts of that. Section 230 was upheld. And based on that model, Europe made an uh, e-commerce directive. And then India also, acting through the unicetral body, etc., also made Section 79. But, but more recently, what we have seen are the IT rules, right? Fact-checking of news organizations, regulation of online media platforms, traceability to weaken end-to-end -end encryption. Now, in a lot of ways, if we look at this, again, the law has not been seen to be a natural ally towards innovation as well as excellence. It's been seen in opposition in both these instances, not only to technology, but if we scrape the surface a little much more deeper to open access and freedom of expression. It's actually opposed certain values which are being supported by technology. However, these two examples of file sharing and social networking show how much also the world has changed and our understanding of technology has changed in India. For instance, if you would ask many people today if they would, if, if they would support blocking websites or they would support um, greater forms of intermediary liability on platforms, the answer of erosion of, super, uh, of fundamental rights, there are two popular Hindi phrases which would capture it very well. The first is, karne mein kya jata hai? And the second one is, agar kuch bura ho gaya to. There almost seems to be also a kind of, um, uh, of learned risk, of learned uh, 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 sense of fear in terms of the impact of technology. So law itself it has been gathering greater and greater control. Now, I believe I can offer some perspective as a lawyer with early access to technology based on certain things which I noticed over these 15 years. I picked up blogging very early and I used to run a blog under a rather grand title called the India Law and Technology blog. 
where I used to capture many of these interactions between technology, law, and society. I blogged through my many years of law school, masters, and continued it in early years of practice. What struck me as I looked back beyond those typos and the passive speech that I used was a persistent effort to make sense of the response of legal frameworks to information technologies. So there were two big points which I saw. The first one, of course, was the overwhelming trust in technology, which is not there today. I think that trust in technology to some extent has left us. But there was a disdain of law, which I think still continues today. The institutions of governance were perceived to be rotten, inefficient, and got in the way of cool things like ripping CDs or our freedom to speech. And what, it, what, what also um, was very noticeable in that period, at least for me, was that we exercised it much more freely. For instance, I remember calling our prime minister corrupt without any kind of thinking that any kind of risk sanction would come to me, even if the sanction would be that, how can you say this at a founding day? I think those kind of things were fairly fine. So please excuse if it sounds out of touch with today, but this was a statement I made 15 years ago. Second, it almost seemed that the development of information technologies with, was without thought to its social impact. If there was any thought, it was obscure and an afterthought. Understandably, goals were personal. It was popularity in the hostel, scoring a date, even more seriously to look for a good job, immigrate abroad, or make immense wealth. These may be the same goals today, but I do not draw any moral judgment on any of them, for I have been also uh, motivated towards them at different points in my life as much as any other person. However, the structural influence of venture capital, which infused a certain form of commercial and economic influence on technical development, has been recognized today, which was existing in that period. This exists, for instance, in Margaret O'Mara's book, Cod Code, which was the merger. She explains how the merger of Stanford and venture capital happened and how do these companies come about. Or if you want to look closer to India, there's a great book by Kashyap Deora called The Golden Tap. These two trends, I think, led to a form of exceptionalism in sense that do not touch technology. It's not as if in India we did not create rules, but they were practiced through the hidden knowledge of exceptions. That rules were not only not enforced, but exceptions themselves became the rule. And it was felt that India's commercial and technological growth was necessary and the social benefits to it would follow and would be natural. Hence, the government should not stand in the way. Here, the path was through information technology development that required protection by forbearance. In many ways, this libertarian worldview became cemented with demands for clear empirical and data-backed evidence prior to any regulatory intervention, as much as the rights risks were very evident. Now, this cost and benefit analysis then in turn made the benefits of technology entirely private and it has resulted in the continuity of certain power imbalances in our country today. Yes, this is a simple understanding of the world. But if this seems plausible to you, let me engage your curiosity on your role in this and how to shape the future in three simple ways. This is for the students who are here, the few of you who are here. First, modern societies learn from success and failure. They learn on the basis of memory. Now, given there's been a rapid pace of techn technology development, it is not merely a historical artifact, but lives within our experience today. It is fresh in our minds, and today there exists a wide body of research in diverse streams of academic research on their social impact. One of the fundamental realizations over these past 15 years has been that technology is a form of power. It can redistribute it, it can re-establish it, it can deepen it. Second, the terms innovation and excellence are incomplete values for they are towards the service of a overall objective. Here I will demonstrate through two examples. Firstly, on network disruptions and secondly, with respect to end-to-end -end encryption, how greater technical innovation and excellence by itself may not lead to innovation and excellence servicing social goals or goals towards a better society. Third, and this is the normative judgment, this is the part which I do prescribe a much more substantive value, is that the development of information technologies may find some of these answers in the Constitution of India. 
Here, my, I must state at the outset, it does not mean that the Constitution is an end in itself. It is not above question. But I do plead that its understanding of a document that reflects certain fundamental grand norms of India. It is a foundation of shared social consensus. For instance, even the IIT Act, which was passed, derived its power on the basis of certain constitutional entries. Now, first, let me take network disruptions, which is my first example. Network disruptions uh, have been going on in India, if one looks at it, I think around 2006, 2007, which are called also internet shutdowns. But I first got involved in it when the internet was shut down in the state of Gujarat on the sidelines of protests by the Patidar community who are asking for reservations. And here, the state government used to block only mobile-based internet access, not wired line access. And the high court held that because they were permitting wired line access, this restriction was proportional. At least you're allowing something, right? And they reasoned that mobile-based internet access by itself had the tendency based on the state saying so that it could lead to law and order issues. Now, there was a technical issue in this that there were no rules. There was no procedure prescribed under the Telegraph Act at that point in time for the state government to exercise this power. And as per earlier Supreme Court judgment, this was unconstitutional. Because to exercise a restriction on fundamental rights, you need procedure. Without procedure, there can't be safeguards. So you can exercise the power in any condition. So the court said, till you make procedure, you cannot actually exercise it. It happened, for instance, in the PUCL judgment with regard to telephone tapping. So I drew an analogy. I thought because there's no such procedure for internet shutdowns, well, you can challenge it and till the point the government comes out with a procedure or maybe the court lays down one, internet shutdowns will not happen. But it ran into a form of institutional culture which was thinking that internet by itself is a convenience. It's a luxury. And there was a degree of paternalism which existed in which the local state authorities would obviously always account for law and order. So I argued this appeal before a bench of Chief Justice, Justice T.S. Thakur and Justice Bhanumati, which refused to engage with this, I think so, technically argument which I had advanced. Well, my argument may indeed have been poor, but years later, it was accepted by the Supreme Court itself in the judgment of Anuradha Basin concerning the internet shutdowns in Jammu and Kashmir. In this case, the union government had later agreed to permit access under what was called as a white listing or a allow list approach. Please remember this was the period of the pandemic where remote work, education, health and social interaction were enabled through internet access. It was fundamental to it. Now, as per a technical analysis which was done by Rohini and Pratik, 80 of the 153 permitted websites in this allow list or white list approach by itself failed to load for meaningful use. Why is that? Well, a modern web page has elements that are hosted by third-party websites, right? So you won't be able to bank if only the bank's website is made available for access. However, those same services used by, let's say, by, by in other parts of the country were not available here. What we saw other state governments doing during the same period of time, let me take this case of Bihar, was another approach which was not like we will allow these 153 websites. It was that we will block and ban social media websites to prevent law and order issues from occurring. Now, this happened quite routinely through orders by the state of Bihar. However, we tend to forget that social media services, internet messaging services are used by public authorities, health and police officials, even families to coordinate for help, health and security. It may even help prevent motivated and technically sophisticated people from installing VPNs and using such services. But then, what about VPNs? Now, take the much more recent example in terms of Manipur, where the High Court itself, in the case of Aribam Dhananjoy Sharma versus State of Manipur, while allowing conditional internet access prevented the use of VPNs. Is this order enforceable? And after all, let's also put a question 
with respect to the findings of a committee of bureaucrats and engineers which proposed filtering and conditional access. All of this exists at a time when the Parliamentary Standing Committee for IT has asked that there is asked for data and official study by the Ministry of Home Affairs or the Department of Telecom for the link between internet shutdowns and the need to maintain peace and public order. Have you done any study? Does it actually work when the risks and the harms are so clear? It does not exist. And here I come to how technology itself may develop. It's not my case that whitelisting may not work perfectly. Of course, it may develop and work perf perfectly. We may even come to VPNs, which in fact automatically implement court orders. But at the root of it is that will this be the internet which is proposing open access, knowledge, discovery, and curiosity? What is the value which is being served by greater innovation and excellence in the development of these services? Let me come to the second example, which is about end-to-end -end encryption. Now, possibly the largest deployment of end-to-end -end encryption today, even beyond the banking sector or certificates for websites, in terms of actual use, exists with respect to WhatsApp. And let me also plug in Signal, okay? Because WhatsApp uses Signal, okay? Now, as these technologies were being popularized in July 2018, when the switch was made automatically, I wrote in the Hindu because there were a lot of concerning news reports which started coming in about lynching, lynchings happening because all of a sudden, rumors were sp spreading all across India with respect to uh, child abduction. These were called child abduction rumors. And curiously, we don't see these reports any longer as much as WhatsApp use, I would speculate, has only grown socially, right? There may be more users using it for more periods of time. And of course, teleconnectivity in India has indeed increased over these years, as well as the number of mobile broadband subscribers. I wrote in the Hindu, a serial killer painted in a luminescent green is on the loose and travels in the pockets of more than 200 million people in India. As per public commentary, it is WhatsApp that has caused the life of more than 20 lives in the past two months alone in this country. Rumors on WhatsApp that there are child kidnappers and cattle traders roaming around have led to mob lynchings. So there was a causality asserted. Such rumors are posited as incontrovertible facts. So I went through these 20 instances, one after the other. I looked at the local news reports by itself, and I found unquestionably in each of these instances that person was not a local resident of that place, so they drew suspicion. They were a person sometimes who looked different, acted different, was from a minority community, or even happened to be some person with disability. So what does that tell us about this entire, I can share the spreadsheet later if it's of curiosity to any of you. Now what does it pose? It poses a very uncomfortable question. It poses a question that if WhatsApp is not to blame, what is to blame? And I think this deeper question, the answer for it will not be found in changing how encryption works or how technology is developed. However, policymakers had an easier solution than what I had in mind. And of course, it's a much more comforting, warm solution to what may be much more troubling questions which may not be fixed through this. It was called traceability, and essentially it attempted to draw identification of the first originator or author of a message on WhatsApp by itself. So in a set, each message, each text on WhatsApp would be linked to the identity of the person who would compose that message. So even if you would type a small space, of course, its value would change, right? Of course, there would be other things which would happen as well. But this suggestion was taken very seriously. In fact, it is part of the IT rules today. But before that, in a public interest litigation titled as Anthony Clement Rubin versus Union of India, before the Madras High Court, a technical committee was constituted. There were uh, professors from the uh, faculty at the IIT in Madras. There was a professor there who stated that, yes, it is possible in these three ways through a technical affidavit, and it will not break the protections in end-to-end -end encryption. 
And contrary to that, uh, ISOC stated that it did fundamentally weaken established protocols of end-to-end -end encryption which had been tested over a long period of time. But I think a much more valuable contribution to that was through an expert affidavit which opposed this technical committee. It was by Professor Manoj Prabhakaran, who's at IIT Bombay. He stated that the proposal suggested by Dr. So-and-so is vulnerable to falsification of originator information by bad actors to frame an innocent person for sending an illegal message. And he suggested that the use of digital signatures to mitigate the risk of spoofing may ultimately, with these modifications, undermine the long-term effectiveness of the proposal. It may not result in actually catching who sends the first message regarding a rumor, as much as that rumor may lead to catching a person who led to death by uh, public lynching. Now, based on this experience, we should question such a technology, what would be its function creep for a society which does not have a data protection law? Does it create greater state control? Do we have no comparable examples, for instance, how messaging applications such as Weibo are used in China, where identification indeed exists? where censorship can be done of messages which are exchanged in terms of messages just not being sent because they are contained within a filter list. And these are fundamental questions which we need to ask as we search for excellence and innovation. Now, finally, I will not state the preambular objectives for the founding of our republic from the Constitution of India. They're easily accessible. I just hope that I have given you some sense of curiosity that if you ever are at the crossroads, at the junctions of asking yourself these questions, to also look at the Constitution. But some of you may be asking also, what is some two or three tangible things you can pick up? And these are very practical suggestions which I'll offer because it may also give some value to this kind of high theory. The first is, if there does not exist one, start and join a free and open source software community. It comes without the controversy and the difficulty of negotiating partisan differences that have grown socially in recent years. Second, welcome diversity of thought beyond the technical discipline in which you work. Grow greater fraternity with the liberal arts. They both advance human knowledge. Reach out and collaborate with centers, for instance, of philosophy or ethics which may exist in your institute. Finally, embrace your power as engineers but disclaim it with the humility of recognizing that if we did not know some things 15 years ago, we do not know a lot of things even today. And there are limits to individual knowledge and hence foresight. We are not know-it-alls, especially lawyers like me. I accept it. Okay? And towards the end, finally, many of you may have watched Oppenheimer, the self-deprecatory comment by him which has stuck in popular imagination today that I have become the destroyer words. This phrase particularly appeals to us in India for its cultural link to a scientific de development that altered the course of humanity. But again here, we need to ask, as he was asking himself, innovation and excellence serve what ends. Here I hope some of you may even be able to watch the documentary feature called I Am 20 by the Film Institute of India. It features students from engineers from IIT Bombay, but also farmers and service officers, all of whom turned 20 in August 15, 1967. Their birth dates were August 15, 1947. Their birth, hopes, dreams, ambitions, in any ways reflected what they hoped to do for India, sometimes hoped to do for themselves. But more importantly, a later reflection shows for how many the path strays as intended, and for others it changes dramatically. For instance, I didn't imagine I would be doing this today, ever. My dream in law school was to be a senior advocate, to come in a big car, to have an office, and possibly to argue one constitutional case every year, but primarily have a commercial practice. Now, if you look at this documentary, look at what happened to these people, and there is another YouTube video on that. Where are they after 15 years? The path of their life alters dramatically. The person who says, I want to be in a comfortable bureauc bureaucratic job, ends up going and sitting on the boards of Fortune 500 companies and being in a very high-stress environment. The person 
who says they just want to make money comes back to India and services rural communities. And this is the path of life and I hope that these kind of experiences provide you the kind of definition to the value of excellence and innovation. I hope the constitution of India can play a part in this journey. Finally, what happened to Professor Lessig? He is the person who coined Cody's law. Well, he worked actually to uh, not reform code, uh, law through code, but actually work on institutional and legal reform. And his self-authored bio on his website now states, beginning in the mid-1990s, his focus shifted to the internet and intellectual property. Since 2007, his focus has been on institutional corruption and the fight to establish a representative democracy in America. That project was meant to take 10 years. It has taken a bit longer. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir. That was really insightful. Now we'll be opening the platform for some questions. If somebody has some questions, there's one question at the back. Thank you for the talk, Upper. Uh, so it was law as code, but I believe law should promote equity. First of all, why is the mother of justice blind? And uh, it, it is blind, of course, as blindfolded, shown by the black. But she's mum also, right? She doesn't speak, she's just an idol. If at all she's mum, why isn't there a plaster also on her mouth? And moreover, because I said law should promote equity, why is she mother of justice? Why can't there be father of justice? Why is there a gender bias towards? Second thing, timeline of events, right? In induction event, we had uh, a sexual harassment uh, induction. But over the course of time, in Asia, there was a big ads on condoms. So what is the stark contrast? So uh, recently, there have been incidents of alumni misconduct. And today, alumni are going to be awarded on the foundation. So what's all this? Thank you so much. So I think there's a large sense of symbolism around the law, right? And that's also because uh, if you look at, historically, if you look at where does the law come from, you need to see where does authority come from. And authority essentially uh, was asserted in medieval periods through authority which is derived by divine right. It came from God. And there needed to be a representative of God. And it was first a priest, and then there was some person who was born that way. And they gave birth to another person who was born that way. And then... There was, an entire, uh, there was an entire universe created around it, just like Marvel, just like DC, right? So there were people who wrote those scripts, right? And there were high priests. So that's why lawyers wear robes. And that's why there's this, uh, even this, so the thing is, if, if you look at the Bombay High Court, for instance, uh, the architecture in the Bombay High Court has a crooked monkey uh, in which only one of the eyes of that monkey are, um, are, are uh, uh, you know, uh, have a blindfold. And that's because the, it's, uh, the myth holds that the contractors were not paid on time. And I kind of think it's true because one of the earliest arbitration cases actually on enforceability were, was an arbitration case by the civil contractors for the people who constructed the High Court of Delhi. What I'm coming to is that there's historical continuity through which law derives symbolism. I think that that's changed in the uh, day and age of information technologies, this is not theoretical. Today the law needs to derive its legitimacy on the basis of public trust, not because I told you so, but because we believe that it is so in that sense, right? So that's the first part. And just like mother of democracy, father of democracy, my views are like, much more progressive. I think gender, etc. Um, we are, I hope we are able to walk towards uh, uh, larger spectrum of uh, recognition of human personality. Um, of course, these things will remain, okay? Law is a little stodgy, it's a formal system, right? Uh, the second question which you asked me, I couldn't understand it fully, but uh, you were uh, saying something about an induction, etc., things like that.
during the induction program you had an extensive sexual harassment uh, 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 over you even then i would like to ask why can't there be equal representation of men in the ha committee like there are incidents of even men being harassed right so anyway in society fine so that was the time the timeline of events in the sci event this is a cultural event there were large uh, acts of what's your name i am praharshit sharma okay my other name kanchinadam sharma praharshit sharma yeah so uh, in the sci there were many i mean very big acts of condoms so what what is what, what is a stark contrast and just few weeks ago there were alumni misconduct like five alumni were banned from entering the institute and now alumni go, are going to be awarded there's going to be a panel on uh, commendable alumni of triple id delhi so, so like, uh, like, like is a public memory going to, is public memory is going to be very short uh, it may be short but i am a bioinformatician i apply software to biology so uh, my memory is not short i can remember everything vividly right from my birth so prayash i'll say a few things the first thing is that uh, you've gotten up you've uh, made your comment and uh, it also shows that there is a venue there is the facility for you to state these things as well as uh, these may not be to your liking right so i think uh, if there's no social sanction on you the institute is encouraging and i hope it encourages this kind of uh, uh, comment as much as they may not really like it it makes people uncomfortable it should be permitted uh, so but yeah but uh, see here's th here's the thing i am the speaker uh, i hope you are given the stage one day as well and i'm empathizing with you in your comment but at the same time what i'm saying is that i do disagree that there needs to be an equal number of men and women on a posh committee for instance because if you notice even in my speech and this is how much power is coded i've only quoted men right women's labor women's work women's power does not exist in our society to the extent you may perceive it does right now that is why even these committees of sexual harassment women are placed there for ensuring that there is a fair hearing because after all a victim is approaching not only for their own injury but also what happens to them later right the employment prospects their social social respectability all of that is impacted to a wide extent i'll come back to you i uh, yeah thank you um that's okay i i do we have any more questions please yes. <laughs> hi apa you want to talk something about the data protection act could be free uh, yeah i i i i'll do it uh, okay. after taking some specific comments all right and uh, some of this i've written about already okay uh, yeah so like uh, there is interesting sort of faction of people that have the opinion that we could replace these sort of codes and constitutions and all with some sort of code with some sort of technology yes. and you know ai or whatever now i'm personally of the opinion you know that this is kind of a silly idea because like we have judges in the courts because we can't really write down all of the rules that's what i think but you know um yeah like what do you think because there's a lot of people who think that you know code as law in a very different sense that you know yes. we have code that yes. is treated as law. what do you think like is a future like that possible is it a good idea is it a bad idea i i think it's a terribly uh, it's a terrible terrible idea it's a escapist idea mm -hmm. primarily i don't think so it's a uh, it's motivated out of uh, 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 some kind of uh, uh, evil design Uh, to create a new world order etc those kind of conspiracy things it's born out of the same kind of techno optimism where we are trying to fix problems which cannot directly be fixed with technology because uh, social problems are much more complex for instance uh, we are uh, you may say that we'll devise some kind of large camera netted network in uh, delhi to tackle crime malba dumping etc and i'm saying malba dumping because it happens all over here 
However, if you don't take care of the underlying, and uh, not only incentives, but values of solidarity and incentives will essentially be rooted not only in corruption, but also ease of disposal of garbage waste or production at its very source and site itself, as well as social values in a sense in which people start seeing public property as common property and resources. These things and these changes will not happen through a camera netted <laughs> network and a very high degree of uh, power which is imposed through fines or fines which are not implemented than through physical force. Um, I'm aware of certain kinds of deployments which promise transparency, openness, immutability, DAOs for instance, etc. But let us just ask how many people even have access to smartphones in India? who do not have access to smartphones in India, possibly women, possibly minorities, possibly people who work for us, right? Uh, they share their smartphones in a way, right? So you're already disenfranchising a large part of the world as much as even these solutions may be presumed to be perfect. And it's not only in India, if you look at reports which have come through based on questionnaires regarding how public face technologies are delivered for people even in Europe. People who are above the ages of 55 to 60 are complaining. They are saying they want physical spaces where they can go and they can interact with the person rather than just navigate a digital platform. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to uh, question, uh, no, I'm trying to place the burden back on the person who proposes a solution to actually present evidence that it works. Thank you, Hi, uh, so with regards to your comment on, uh, you know, public trust and public telling the law that, okay, this is what we feel is the correct way, uh, the public trust itself can be persuaded, like how we saw in the Cambridge Analytica case or uh, other cases of influencing any form of, like, popularity or, or vote. So how then do we even develop a trust on the concept of public trust? Through hard work, organizing, community development, uh, things which we don't do today, things which our, uh, uh, our public representatives don't do today, I think uh, that needs to be done more and more. And we have to, uh, I think so, uh, the, so the thing is that we are also living in a society which is very polarized, fractious. Uh, there, are, uh, there are people who don't talk politics on the dinner table as much as it's a very Indian thing because people in families are afraid they won't get along. But I think ultimately uh, the progress of human society has been on the basis that we move together, even ants do. So I think we can do that. Uh, but I do think so there will be uh, there will be a need for recognition. There will be a need for more people to say that let's search for agreement rather than only disagreement, right? Those things will need to be done. I think there will be a uh, like bottoming out of values will go much much, much lower to rise up again. I hope it does not happen, but I do sense it will happen. And of course, please don't forget, um, your institute invited me for a talk here today. And when I got the invitation, I was feeling that, uh, how can a person like me who holds these kind of opinions and views be invited to an institute to speak without any censorship? Yet I've been provided that platform. I've got an opportunity to engage with you, possibly five or 10 new people for the first time. And I think they'll take something back home. They'll think about these things. I hope they look at the preamble of India once in their lives. So yeah, I think these things happen slowly. Uh, um, of course, uh, and we need to also think a little differently than Silicon Valley boys of scalable change and user acquisition from small iterative change. I read this book by Cory Doctorow and uh, uh, Rebecca, uh, it's uh, excellent. It's called Choke Point Capitalism, and it's a, it has a very inspirational line. It says that change is always iterative. How do you eat elephant but one bite at a time? So, yeah. <laughs> we have time for one more question, anyone? Um, 
some six or seven years ago, there was a case referred to the CJEU, to the European Union. Yes. This was uh, Facebook and uh, this involved Eva Glash, Glavishnik Piszczek and Facebook. She was an Austrian minister. Somebody put a comment on Facebook and she wanted it struck down. They called her a fascist or something like that. Yeah. She asked for it to be struck down. And in the judgment, it, it went to the Austrian court, then it was referred to the CJEU. And in their judgment, they said, this post will be taken down and the platform has to monitor for identical and equivalent yes. posts. So the controversy was around, how do you interpret equivalent? Uh, the point I'm trying to make is, uh, in this situation, what counts as an equivalent post to the original post is not something that can be programmable as in programmed code, yeah. but it harkens back to another meaning of code, which is the medieval meaning of code as meaning, yes. uh, like code of law, yes. like that. So I'm just wondering if this just uh, reinvokes the old debates in jurisprudence between legal positivism and uh, decisionism where can you completely treat law as programmable code or will law always retain that decisionism? So this is the first question I had for you. Second is something of a comment related to this and what the gentleman was saying earlier, which is that uh, our artificial intelligence systems are biased, they say, and we need to have uh, safeguards, chat GPTs, making this, whatever, like all of that stuff. So then they try to put these safeguards, but then there are ways of prompt engineering and getting behind that. But ultimately, what these artificial intelligences reflect is something that is synthesized from data that comes from the social. Yeah. So what I want to say is that uh, maybe it's not a technological problem. And like Jean-Jacques Rousseau said about constitutionalism, you really need the keystone, which is yes. the moors or the morals. Yes. So I don't know if it's an entirely technical problem. So yes, that's what I it's not a technical problem. So the second one is easier. I'll agree with you. I was uh, at a private workshop on generative AI and I think we have come to the level of understanding for people who have followed the literature is that yes, we looked at uh, not only in generative AI but even vision recognition, etc. There are documented problems of exclusion through misidentification or bias by itself, right? bias by itself being a product of discriminatory uh, output. But what happens when you gain complete accuracy? And this is what some parts of it I also said in my talk, right? What happens when our social uh, values are reflected in uh, a technical system? The, and here I think so the social value by itself has been moderated, at least in law, through writing it down and by saying, no, that's awful, the social value is awful. It's basically presuming that there needs to be an unequal power relationship between two human beings based on their identity and markers of identity. And that's what modern constitutions have given, that equalization of power, at least the hope of that. But I believe that only comes about in deterministic systems by itself, as much as they may be uh, uh, inaccurate, is that when they become actually accurate is when the problem starts happening, according to me. If they only reflect social values. Which is why I always say that, yes, if it has a legal impact, then it needs to be governed by the law. And of course that legal impact can't be very, very remote, right? They did this, then in turn this happened, and then that led to this. But if it's a direct technical system which leads to an entitlement being denied, it requires a form of legal regulation. Now, your first one, um, it's a little much more knotted for me because it goes back to my jurisprudence lectures. And I'll be honest to say that I don't know a right answer to it. But I'm happy to have this conversation with you. Uh, when I'm less on the spot, less in the light. Right. I would like to invite Professor Vikram Goyal to felicitate sir for his enlightening views. Watch <laughs>
Thank you, sir. We would now request the faculty members to move to the green room for a short tea break. So before we leave, can I can you just take 30 seconds to respond to a thing that came about publicly? Can I just take your attention for 30 seconds? Since it was uh, since there's no one from the <coughs> Office of Student Affairs here today to respond, and I'm probably the closest one to being from the Office of Student Affairs, I want to make it at least clear that condom ads, as represented by a person earlier, do not go against sexual harassment. 